It's great to be here. Good morning, everyone. And uh, what an incredible day it is weather-wise. I'm thinking a lot about weather and climate. Climate is your, let's see, how does this go? I always get them mixed up. Climate is your personality. No, no, climate is your, yeah, climate is your personality. And weather is your mood, right? <laughs> so, uh, and the way that people like Jacqueline, climate scientists and their kin measure climate is in increments of about 30 years. And 30 years, the average conditions for whether it's Aspen or global or the Hudson Valley where I live, that's defined as the climate as we were talking earlier, Jacqueline, the, the term in climatology is normal. That's the normal. So uh, climate change is when between that 30 years and the next 30 years, there's some different measurable difference that's statistically significant. And then you know there's something going on at that scale. Whether and how much of that is human driven is a whole nother question. Attribution of that in a turbulent system is really hard. And, but that, that idea of a 30-year increment I thought was useful in thinking about this, this year's Aspen ideas uh, exploration of these issues. So we're going to talk about 30 years of learning and unlearning in looking at climate change, climate science itself, and looking at the ec economics. Uh, that'll be through Jacqueline Gill here from the University of Maine, who is also a podcast mate of mine. Uh, we started with Eric Holthaus a podcast a year and a half ago or something like that called our warm regards, it's getting, it's in reboot mode right now. Michael Greenstone from the University of Chicago will give us uh, sort of the climate policy change in economics. He's a uh, background in economics, but has been immersed in climate policy for a long time. And then we'll talk about energy on the same context. You know, what are the lessons you can learn from what has and hasn't happened in the last 30 years in how um, we, and we are a certain segment of the global society, and others in uh, less energized countries uh, get their energy. So looking at the last 30 in the context of the next 30 feels really useful. And of course, there's this big uh, asteroid style disruption of everything that happened with the election last year. So part of what we'll explore is how, how big a deal that is or how little a deal that is in the grand scheme of this journey uh, of human understanding of this complex system. Not just the climate itself, but, but our system of responding to it or, or not, and, uh, and how we get our energy. And we'll start, we'll start with, um, well, actually, I just want to give you a, little, a couple markers about the last 30. The other reason it's useful to think of the last 30 years is because global warming basically started 30 years ago as a story, as a, as a front page news story. It had, I, I have a book coming out on the history of human understanding of weather and climate, and there's 100 years ago, in 1912, there was a really good uh, article about greenhouse gas-driven climate change in Popular Science magazine, and it got reprinted all over the world. Uh, but it really wasn't like headline news until 1988. So next year is 30 years since climate change became a story. Yellowstone was on fire. Uh, there was an epic heat wave here. Um, uh, Europe was also having high temperatures. Um, Jim Hansen did that. Uh, uh, really important testimony, it was Tim Wirth hearing uh, in the Senate, where he said, by his reckoning, climate change was already, uh, greenhouse gas driven climate change was already measurable. Uh, 1988 was when the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was, was uh, formed by the UN and 180 or so countries. Uh, the first, this was a meeting in Toronto in 1988, it's the first international conference on the changing atmosphere, that's what they called it. Uh, and I, I was there reporting a, a story. I, so a story I did for Discover Magazine. It was my first cover story on global warming. So that was 1988. Uh, so I was, I was 31 when that happened. I'm 61 now. So, so it's a, again, when you get to that age, you start to reflect a lot more. When you're young, you, you're, you're still looking forward mostly. So, so that's why we're going to use this framing. Uh, so Jacqueline, your work is particularly uh, it's all about looking backwards in the context of what's now and what's to come. Can you explain a little bit about that, what like paleoclimatology and paleoecology, and then how that, your lessons learned uh, reflect how you think about the future? Yeah, so I, I think this, first the theme of this panel is really interesting because I was born just before our current climate normal started. So our normal is 1981 to 2010. So that's everything that's happening now. We're comparing to that window. Um, and so I've basically lived through, this is the first climate normal I've lived through um, <laughs> completely. And so, uh, but as a, a paleoecologist, that 30 year window is sometimes, you know, smaller than the margin of radiocarbon dating error, right? And so 
um, I, I'm, I tend to think uh, on sort of century or millennial scale changes in the, the climate system, which isn't to say though that um, the kinds of work that paleoecologists and paleoclimatologists do uh, isn't relevant to what's happening now because having a, a, a 4,000 or 10,000 or even 2 million year record of climate change uh, contextualizes what's happening today even, even beyond what that 30 year normal might be. Um, we've been having climate normals for about a century now and of course each normal gets progressively warmer. But it's important to know, you know whether or not what's happening now is part of an, a natural cycle and in fact you know, we have had two and a half million years of ice ages and warm periods um, and it's, it's precisely that climate variability that allows us to contextualize what's happening in the, in the coming century or the next you know, 30 years. And so one of the things that's really changed, I think, during this 30-year period of, of the, la you know, the last few decades of understanding climate change is we've had a, a really tremendous amount of work done on contextualizing the Earth's climate system um, over very long time scales, understanding the machinery that drives the atmosphere, the oceans, the land surface, and their feedbacks. And we, you know, it's, it's easy to lose sight of time. I spent a lot of time thinking about longer time scales. Um, but it's important to remember that you know, some of these records are incredibly high resolution. We might have annual or now even sub-annual records coming out of ice cores, um, tree ring records that are thousands of years of sub-annual um, records of, of the climate system. And so you know, there's really been a, a renaissance in, in paleoscience in the last decades and, how, and that, that, that has then fed into our, our contemporary understanding of climate change. And not just in terms of how the Earth's climate works, um, but all, you know, the linkage between carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases and temperature, for example, but also how biodiversity responds to that. And that's a, um, a big uh, intersection with the sort of work that, that I do as a paleoecologist. So I, I spend a lot of time wondering, you know, how fast can trees move on the landscape? Of course, the trees aren't walking. It's not Macbeth. They're throwing their genes around. But, um, they did in Lord of the Rings, right, yeah. Um, so yeah, how fast can species you know, m migrate across the landscape? Can they keep pace with climate change? What are the actual mechanisms in past climate changes that drive extinctions um, that are related to climate change? Because we often find it's not necessarily warming per se, but it's all the sort of collateral impacts of climate change, um, sea level rise, changing patterns in the atmosphere, the position of the, of the jet stream we know shifts through time and, and that you know, can have huge implications for biodiversity. Um, what kinds, uh, how, how quickly can the climate system change and how quickly can species respond? So one of the things that's really kind of come out of the last couple of decades in, in uh, climatology and paleoclimatology is this recognition of abrupt events, abrupt climate change. So this idea that um, the climate system can change very rapidly within the lifespan of humans or, um, or, or longer lived organisms, certainly. And so these are all relevant um, to our sort of understanding of the next century. So being able to contextualize what's normal, and I think that's had some interesting surprises in terms of especially looking at patterns of moisture in places like the Southwest, or being able to understand that, you know, there are, there are times where in much of North America or places in Africa where we have had droughts that have lasted centuries or millennia. That's, you know, a very long time, maybe even punctuated by, you know, increased, um, you know, storms. So it's, you know, imagine trying to grow crops where for a century it's really dry, and then when it's not, it's you know a deluge, right? And so there's, there will be challenges, I think, even just looking at the natural variability of the Earth's climate system coming in the next few decades. And we'll get back to some examples of that in a few minutes. So, so Michael Greenstone, um, you've been tracking the uh, economics and policy questions the last 30 years. Uh, one of the, uh, to me, one of the learning moments was the transition from Copenhagen to Paris, which mm -hmm. was, it seems like there was this expectation. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the, 1987, 30 years ago now, was the Montreal Protocol. So everyone, you know, we had done this great thing with, with the ozone depleting substances where uh, there was a treaty, it had targets and timetables. And, and I think there was this expectation when gl global warming then emerged that CO2 could be kind of like CFCs and we'll just have that same template and we'll just have this treaty and everyone will sign it and go forward. Then Copenhagen happened and that kind of unraveled and now we're back to something different. So that's, which is more like Rio in 1992, sort of aspirational and mm -hmm. non-binding. That's my impression, but I don't know if you have your own impression of what lessons you've taken from the last 30. Yeah, I think there's, I guess there's the direct policy and then there's the way that we understand climate change uh, and its economic impacts. And my own view is that if, you know, in this characterization of the last 30 years, it's kind of been characterized by two degrees C is really, really bad. Uh, and 
it's a little unclear where two degrees C came from. Our climate scientist friends kind of produced it. Uh, they didn't include the economists, which is a little, uh, you know, always sad for the economists. Uh, but at the end of the day, no one really knows what two degrees C means, is my view. Uh, you know, many of you are probably better educated than me, but in the Chicago Public Schools, you know, every September we would begin the year with, okay, this is the year we're really gonna go metric. Uh, and then <laughs> about three weeks later, the teacher would say, you know what, this is too hard. We're, we're just going to stick with Fahrenheit. So it's not just that it's denoted in a unit that people don't understand, uh, but it's not in a, there's not an impact associated with that. Like, well, how is that actually going to change my life? And so I would say from the research side, uh, there has, that's kind of where we've gotten to. And I now feel uh, that we're at the dawn of a new era, uh, which in a full disclosure I'm trying to contribute to, where due to advances in computing and due to advances in data uh, and due to advances in statistical techniques, we can kind of answer the questions that Andy likes to answer, like the, I think the journal, journalism questions are who, what, where, when, why, and how. Mm -hmm. And we can provide much more detailed uh, understanding of, uh, you know, what will be the impacts of climate change. So one thing that's come out of my research is the impact uh, of a very hot day defined as greater than 95 degrees Fahrenheit, not Celsius, uh, it on mortality is uh, 25 times higher in India than it is in uh, the United States. And I think that's you know, a, a way that people can grab hold of in a, a much more meaningful way. So I would say on the kind of understanding climate change, and I, I think it's imp that importantly feeds right into the policy process. Uh, and I, I think some of that actually was, uh, became visible in Paris, uh, which is that you had countries who had effectively uh, said, you know what, this is not our problem. We're not going to be engaged in this. Uh, this is, you guys caused, the industrialized countries caused this problem, and it's your job to fix it. And uh, I think there's an increasing recognition that the impacts of climate change are going to be highly heterogeneous. Uh, there's going to be places in the world that are really going to suffer quite dramatically. There'll be places that, you know, I, I think Vladimir Putin is probably thinking there's going to be some pluses for Russia. Uh, and I think that is now reflected in what I see, uh, admittedly non-binding, but much deeper engagement uh, from countries around the world. So I, I would say in the, yes, we have the American exceptionalism going on in the aftermath of the election. But if you step back from it, I think there, the world has kind of evolved and recognized uh, that climate change is a threat that maybe everyone uh, would like to participate in, and it's going to affect different people in different places uh, in different ways. And with each contributing to this global effort uh, according to what they feel they can do uh, within their borders uh, on their own terms without someone <coughs> having a carbon police top-down approach. Yeah, and I, I hope we can turn back to this later, and yeah. I, I don't want to take too much time on your initial question, but I think one thing that I'll even object to your framing of the, uh, is that I really don't think it's a, uh, I don't think of it as a climate change problem. Uh, I actually think of it as a global energy problem. Uh, and that that global energy problem has climate as an incredibly critical leg in that stool of it. But in addition, uh, and importantly, there, there's enormous disparities in access to energy. And in a lot of places in the world, you know, it's a little bit difficult to talk about, well, you know, temperatures are going to go up by a couple degrees C or a couple degrees F or whatever it is in 20 years when, and uh, just an example, in the state of Bihar in India, uh, there's 100 million people there. That's a third of the U.S. approximately. Uh, per capita electricity consumption, there's 130 kilowatt hours per year per person. You know, so for those of you who aren't energy nerds, what it is in the United States, it's 13,000. So they're, they're off by two zeros. Yeah. And so... I think you have to see that whole problem interlinked. Uh, and only focusing on the climate part can lead to, a, in, in my view, kind of an excessive uh, focus, like kind of a US perspective of, you know, we really care about climate change. The energy thing is taking yeah. care of it for us. But it, it, it's a broader problem. For sure. And that's why Varun is here. Uh, Varun Sivaran from the Council on Foreign Relations, who has a PhD in which part of physics? Condensed matter. Condensed matter physics, but he dove in very early on to working in uh, photovoltaics and uh, related energy issues. But now he's uh, getting broader again into the policy questions related to all, uh, how do we get enough energy to 
foster human progress without overheating the planet, which is this, the same circular uh, reality we've been describing. And the, what, what's interesting is, uh, in my learning curve through these 30 years, I've also, I have split things into two, two very different ways to look at this. One is climate vulnerability is one challenge and opportunity that can be worked on right now in a huge way that addresses some of these questions about uh, that, that vulnerability to heat that you mentioned, and energy. I, uh, how do you do the energy thing? They really are separate problems. They got, they got conflated in our environmental conversation in the last 30 years is you had to talk about this, the whole thing together. Uh, you know, it's a global warming, we need these energy solutions. And I think that actually was not productive, but we, we'll go back to that. So Varen, last 30, next 30 in terms of energy, and, and as we said, there is no we, right? India, is a, India has a two ton per person per year CO2 footprint. Uh, U.S. did a great achievement of going from 20 to 17 tons per person per year CO2 <laughs> footprint. Uh, and within India, there's this, as you just heard from Michael, there's this huge population of people who are completely under-energized. So what's your lessons learned and where do we go from here in the energy side? Yeah, you know, I, 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 and thanks, Andy, for having me. Thanks to the Aspen Institute. Um, I'd say there are three types of lessons that we've learned uh, in the last 30 years. Let me start with just the last decade. The first lesson we learned is that uh, the venture capital model for funding new clean energy technologies uh, might not work for some subsets of clean energy technologies. And this is important because new clean energy technologies will be necessary uh, to avert catastrophic climate change, no matter how we define it. You know, Michael mentioned it may not be two degrees C, but no matter what the threshold is, to avert it, we're going to need a clean energy transition. And we're also going to need uh, new technologies in order to meet the other policy goals that Michael and Andy just mentioned. For example, energy access in India. New technologies are going to be needed for that. Unfortunately, over the last decade, uh, we learned that the venture capital model, particularly in Silicon Valley, uh, for funding many of these breakthrough new technologies, just wasn't up to the task for various reasons. Venture capitalists, by the way, spent $25 billion funding these new technology companies and lost over half of it. Um, and, and in particular, companies that were commercializing new materials, uh, for example, for solar panels, chemicals for batteries or uh, manufacturing processes, these are the ones that required a lot more investment than a company like Facebook that a venture capitalist might have been used to. It took a lot longer for their technology to reach maturity and once it did reach maturity, it was often uh, not possible to return as much capital as a venture capitalist uh, might have wanted. So many of these companies withered on the vine. I do want to point out that a counterexample is sitting in the front row. Um, I should say that K.R. Sridhar, CEO of Bloom Energy, one of the few companies that was doing fundamental technology innovation and has been quite successful. Um, but, but we learned that this, uh, for, for, for many companies, this model uh, does not work. Um, and so that brings me to kind of my second lesson, which is in the absence of a, a, uh, a private sector funding environment that works for new technologies and for new innovation, we also found out some things about what the federal government and public policy uh, can do to fill that gap. You know, in the 1970s, the United States responding to the oil crises hiked up its investment in research, development, and demonstration of new energy technologies. But then in the 80s, under the Reagan administration, oil prices fell, and the United States uh, reduced its investment considerably. Now, the theory was if you reduce public investment, you might make room for the private sector. Unfortunately, that theory didn't work out very well. Private investment in clean energy technology fell by like 50%. Um, so that was the first lesson we learned. Volatility in funding for clean energy innovation is not a good thing uh, for those technologies. It strands them. And the second thing we learned is most recently in this last decade, as you saw the startup boom and bust in Silicon Valley, you saw the federal government making, uh, uh, for example, loan guarantees to companies like Solyndra. And we learned that that can have some political blowback if you make extremely large guarantees to certain risky companies. That's not to say that it's a bad thing to take risks. In fact, it's a great thing to take risks. However, uh, we may have learned that the federal government needs to be a little more careful in the way that it uh, allocates its funding priorities, perhaps spreading its bets over more companies, or changing the structure in which it does so. Maybe loan guarantees aren't the way to go. Maybe the way to prove a technology or demonstrate it 
uh, is to have a different kind of institution, one with more independence from the rest of the government. My third lesson, so, so we've talked about how the private funding environment for new technologies isn't great. We've also talked about policies and what we're going to need going forward uh, using what we've learned so far. My third lesson is that you know, we've seen some progress on deploying clean energy. <laughs> Genuinely, uh, solar energy today is 2% of global electricity. Wind, I think, is a little over 5 That's terrific progress. But let's be careful. The lessons we've learned from the incipient phases of this clean energy transition are not necessarily the lessons we'll need to take forward as clean energy becomes mainstream. So when clean energy is supposed to displace fossil fuels substantially, not just nip at its heels, it may need different sorts of economics and products than what we have today. Recently, uh, several colleagues and I published a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences arguing that a 100% renewable energy future is pretty hard. And it could be astronomically expensive with today's energy technologies. That's why we need to keep an open mind on a broad portfolio of technologies and on funding the innovation we need uh, in order to make a clean energy transition economical in the future. So th those are kind of my three lessons that, that I think we can take from the last 30 years and project forward. So we're going to transition a little bit to sort of the politics and perceptions. <laughs> and uh, you mentioned that this paper that just came out was just last week. Um, it was essentially a response to a, a, a body of work by Mark Jacobson at Stanford and others who have been pushing a very popular notion of a very rapid transition to a 100% renewable world, wind, water, solar. Uh, no mention of nuclear, no mention of the need for R&D. Um, and the, this came out. The reactions to these kinds of papers end up being more about what people feel or about your kind of tribe than about the data I've found, especially in climate Given that climate science it itself is full of uncertainties, it's a normal part of climate science, we don't know how, how, how hot it's going to get from a certain buildup of CO2. It could be pretty manageable or it could be catastrophic. So when you have a certain belief, you come to that data, whether it's about renewable energy deployment or about climate itself, you come away with a different lesson. You, some people look at uncertainty and go, okay, never mind. <laughs> some people look at uncertainty and freak out. And there's probably, most of you are more in the, that latter carry category than the former, just because you're here at the Aspen Institute. Uh, it's a pre-selected group. And everyone on this panel has had an interesting uh, immersion in belief and politics as well, including Jacqueline, even as a paleoecologist, because she's become a public figure. Um, so I thought we'd talk a little bit about that, the behavioral science, which is a big part of the economics, too. So Jacqueline, uh, you know, uh, on Twitter and elsewhere, could you just ex explore a little bit your um, experience with, let's call it tribalism for now, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so I and even before that, to provide some context, this is interesting because one of the things we've learned, even as scientists, um, and we, we tend to not play as well with social scientists uh, as some other fields, which is changing um, for the better, I think. But we're learning a lot um, that the ivory tower model of sort of doing your science in isolation is, is not working. Um, and for many people, like people like me, I'm inspired to get out of the ivory tower because I'm a publicly funded scientist from a blue collar background. Um, I do, you know, I do, I work at a, a public land grant institution, so I, I very much believe in that model. Um, for others, it's, you know, the declining funding rates or, um, you know, seeing what's going on in terms of policy and public perception of, of science and climate change in general. And even though scientists are a pretty trusted group compared with other groups, um, trusted by at least in the United States, um, we're, we're learning a lot in terms of what makes effective climate communication. And so, uh, and this tribalism idea really plays into that. There's some work by uh, folks like Dan Gahan in his Cultural Cognition pro Project that really show that, you know, just, just you know, you in the audience looking at us panelists, whoever you identify with the most in terms of us giving off cultural cues that we belong to whatever group you're in, you're going to confer, subconsciously confer authority upon us, right? And so if you tend to identify more with Andy than with me, even if we said the same thing, you would, you would tend to believe Andy more than, more than me. And, mm -hmm. and that's, that's universal, that's across walks of life, right? And so we're learning that this sort of deficit model of climate communication or science communication, this idea that if I just give you the numbers, if I just give you the facts, then I can in inspire you to change your behavior or to drum up public will to you know, vote in favor of some of these policies, that actually doesn't work. Um, folks like Catherine Hayhoe have been really pioneering in terms of really recognizing that it's storytelling and empathy building. And so that, that's where I come from, actually. And, and that has gotten me into a bit of trouble sometimes because I 
A, I tend to be mouthy on the internet um, <laughs> and a bit oversharing, um, but it's all, it's all part of my like meta goal of humanizing climate change and, and climate science, um, especially with this podcast that Andy and I do, Warm Regards, with Eric Holthouse. And so, you know, during one episode, I don't even remember what, what we were, t how we got on this topic, but we were talking about, um, we were talking about transitions and energy decisions that communities make. And I live in rural Maine. Um, I live in, uh, I teach at a university that is 99. We are at the, so, so recently this list came out of universities with a proportion of students who come from the top 1% in terms of their backgrounds. I am at the university that is literally at the bottom of the list. We are 99% blue collar student um, body. And so, um, you know, and I live in a place where, you know, people have been sort of making the, you know, navigating that transition about how to heat their homes. And a lot of folks, especially senior, senior citizens, are starting to move back to coal because coal is actually more affordable for them, even more than wood pellets, even more than some, you know, natural gas. And so, um, you know, when it, I, I grew up in a family that struggled to pay uh, our heating bills in the wintertime, right? And so I empathize with the sort of, uh, even, even in the United States, right, even in the very affluent um, United States, like I come from communities where, where these struggles are playing out. And so, um, you know, and I talked about this, I talked about how, you know, you have to have empathy for people's decision making. And I was, I was told, I was like yelled at by lots of people on the internet um, about how, you know, I'm not, alarm, I'm, not, I'm not being alarmed enough and how, you know, those people should just move, right? If they can't afford to heat their homes in rural Maine yeah. because they're too poor, they should just move somewhere else um, or die, right? <laughs> like those are the sort of options. And, um, and, and that's just not how you... And these are progressives. And these are progressives. Yeah. These are, this is my tribe, yeah. right, of right. people who are saying, you know, you yeah. just need to either let those people go or they should just move somewhere else, right? right. Senior citizens who can't pay their heating bills. Right. So there's a, there's a lack of... Uh, awareness of that tribalism, I think. Uh, we're chipping away at it slowly. Um, but that, that empathy, I think, is, is, is not appreciated enough um, across all of our disciplines in terms of what's motivating people. If you're not getting on the ground and talking to people about what's motivating their decisions as voters or as consumers, um, uh, or even about whether or not they believe your science or they believe you know, the policy suggestions, then all of our great ideas are not going to work. And so the communication side of things is, um, I think an interesting element that we haven't quite brought up on this panel, it's not as much represented, but I mean, I guess we sort of all do it in, a, in one way or another, sure. but it's incredibly important. Yeah, and, and that's, I think I'm gonna get back to that question about if you split this into vulnerability to climate hazards and um, energy transitions, you get a very different political and belief landscape. Uh, a great young uh, video producer for CNN went to Woodward County, Oklahoma, which, which a Yale study identified as the most skeptical county in America on global warming. And uh, he, in, he interviewed um, people, just stand up interviews, people from that, that county. And this one guy who, who's the owner of an oil company, he says, um, at one point they're talking about religion. He says, uh, you know, basically God controls the environment. And, and another woman says, oh, you know, out here Al Gore's name is a cuss word. So if you just listen to that part of that, that one and a half minute part of that video, you, you just, you know, Oh my God, we're, do we're, we're doomed. But the second half, the same guy who owns an oil company says, uh, yeah, we're, tr we're putting solar panels all over our roof. I've invested 30 grand already. I wanna get off the grid entirely. And so here's a guy, he's never gonna vote for Hillary Clinton, top down you know, fear. Uh, he's, he does not wanna pay a check to a utility. Same thing, he's a libertarian. He's not, but you're never gonna convince him that global warming is the reason to act. So do you just, fight, is that what you fight to the death over? Or do you say, hey, we have something in common? And I don't know, you know, this gets to be a very interesting question uh, in, in the literature and economics. Uh, tell us about the social cost of carbon, maybe a little bit. Uh, how do you do that? H how does the government set a social cost of carbon when we know that everyone has a different sense of the value of the future and that kind of thing? Yeah. You, were de you were heavily involved in this. Yeah, so uh, in 2009 and 2010, I worked in the Obama administration and uh, I co-led a process that set uh, U.S. government social cost of carbon. What is the social cost of carbon? Uh, it is the monetized value of the damages associated with the release of an additional ton of CO2 in the atmosphere. That's a, a mouthful, but just think of it as uh, the harm from an extra ton of CO2 uh, that we emit. And the reason having a number like that available is important uh, is because it helps provide a bright line for policies that we should be happy to undertake and policies that we would not be quite as happy to undertake. Uh, and so if it costs, uh, and the, the number is $42 per ton, uh, or at least it was until uh, the Trump administration's executive order in March, uh, and 
the idea is if it costs more than $42 a ton, then it's probably not such a great policy to, uh, to, to abate a ton. If it costs less, then that's a great deal. We're getting $42 of benefits, and it, anyone should want to uh, take that deal. I, what, what I have found, though, in the kind of tribalism of uh, climate science and climate politics uh, is that that very simple idea that we should do things that are beneficial and not do things that are not beneficial somehow gets lost. And even in the kind of call it the climate hawk wing of uh, America. And so l let me give you a couple examples, which I, I projected what uh, Andy was going to ask. Uh, so we, uh, there, the cost per ton abated from, uh, let's see if I can get this right, from a rebates for appliances, according to a recent study, is $600 per ton. Uh, the cost per ton uh, abated for energy, from energy efficiency, residential energy efficiency policies is maybe two or three hundred dollars a ton. Uh, the cost per ton abated uh, from uh, subsidies for electric vehicles is maybe 470 or 500 dollars a ton. So if we use that metric of, well, you're only getting 42 dollars of benefit each time, that doesn't look like uh, such a good deal. Uh, and I, I think it's that unwillingness to be completely uh, steely-eyed about what is good policy that actually, yes, the kind of touchy-feely part of it, but also there's a sense that some of these policies are wasteful. Uh, and I think it would behoove people who are interested in mitigating risk from climate change to be a little tougher about, uh, well, what is a good policy? Just because it has climate wrapped around it does not necessarily uh, make it a good policy. And just as point of comparison, uh, we do have, uh, there are cap and trade programs uh, around the world that are all re getting reductions in CO2 at a cost of $15 or $20 a ton. So it, it, it's not infeasible. Uh, and the last thing I'll note, which uh, was an important paper that you authored, uh, is that a lot of, the, the, there is a, uh, there's an element to the climate debate that has it as feel like this is existential and there's no dollar that should uh, go unspent. And then that bleeds into kind of an engineering problem. Uh, I don't know if anyone watched MacGyver, but like, you know, can I get the tin foil and the piece of gum and the paper clip and like the million engineering things that would have to be done to bring CO2 down to an uh, emissions to acceptable level? And the answer is, yeah, of course you can do that. Like the engineers are super smart and they can figure it out but they've completely lost the thread on how much it costs and societies are just not gonna be willing to pay 10 times the value of something uh, to get that reduction. Yeah, Tony Blair, uh, you know, my learning curve had all this stuff in it. At the uh, Montreal climate talks in 2005, Tony Blair said, um, no country is gonna sacrifice its economy for the sake of this problem. That's almost a precise quote. And, and think about that in the context of where we've gone since. Uh, and obviously it's an overstatement. It's none of this is gonna kill an economy, but, but it is a, it, the reality is there. And so Baron, you know, when you think about the tribalism and, or, and also what Michael was just talking about, what comes to mind? Yeah, let me split this into two categories. First, to respond to some of the things that Michael said. What Michael and, and his colleagues have done on the social cost of carbon is incredibly useful. Uh, at the council, we had a paper evaluating whether fuel economy standards, for, so making your car or truck more, uh, have better mileage, whether those were still a good idea in an era of low oil prices. Because when oil prices are low, there's less of a benefit to you. Um, and we found that actually the social cost of carbon, that $42, was really the marginal wedge needed to drive you from, eh, actually these standards are a little too stringent to actually they're right at the, the right level. So it's important to look at the social cost of carbon in the context of all kinds of other benefits and costs. How much more does this vehicle cost you? How much in fuel savings will you get? And what's the cost of the carbon uh, that you'll abate? Um, I also completely agree with Michael's point that there are all kinds of policies that we might think about. He mentioned things like uh, residential energy efficiency programs. I'll also mention one which is the investment tax credit for certain renewable energy technologies, which probably have a pretty high cost uh, associated with them that may exceed the social cost of carbon. Um, and, and in those cases, I completely agree with Michael's view that the hardline climate extremism that doesn't put a dollar value with these impacts uh, might lead us to the wrong policy outcomes. Now, I'm sure Michael will be the first to tell you that there is some uncertainty over what these dollar values are. Perhaps they're even higher than that $42. Uh, but the point is we should be methodical about it. Um, that brings me to my kind of second point, which is 
you know, in a clean energy transition, you've got to do two things. You've got to figure out where you're going, and then you've got to politically find the will to get there. I find that too often we do these two things separately without talking to each other. So there are a bunch of academics, and I'll, I'll include myself, figuring out where we should go. And we do studies, and we say, you know, we should have this much nuclear energy, and we probably should have this much fossil fuels, and we capture the carbon, and this much wind, and this much solar. And then you have folks who are organizing, who are uh, finding the political will to get to a clean energy future. We may not have done a good enough job communicating, because these folks who are galvanizing folks to action may be galvanizing them toward the wrong actions from the perspective of the academics. So I think it'll be very important to increase the level of coordination because not all actions are good. As Michael mentioned, there may be many actions that just aren't economically worth it. And as Andy mentioned, it's not worth, in some cases, giving up your economy. Um, you need to do a careful cost-benefit analysis, taking into account the uncertainties of these extreme climate impacts. So I think we need to do a better job of bringing those tribes together, the ones who are galvanizing folks and the ones who are trying to figure out where we need to end up, not next year, not 10 years from now, but 40 years from now. Um, and that's a very difficult academic problem to solve. We need to make sure we communicate it more accessibly. Yeah, that time scale issue is so uh, unnerving in some ways when you put it against our what we know about human behavior. Well, and, and, and I'll quickly yeah. say, the first 10% of decarbonization, reducing our emissions by 10%, is way harder than the last 10%. So if we think we're making progress up here, we may be heading toward a cul-de-sac, not a, a highway to deep decarbonization. Sorry to interrupt you. No, no, that's fine. It, actually, I'll ask you, how, maybe each of you, how, do you, how you deal yourselves with um, maintaining momentum and, um, and, and maintaining the rigor of your work when you understand some of the paradoxes, they're not paradoxes, some of the, uh, the tough nuts in the climate problem, one of which is that there's no quick fix, unless you do some magical geoengineering solution to turn the knob down. But the, as we, we could do a whole other session, well, there was a little while ago, one on using mammoths to do that. But um, setting that aside, we're in for um, a substantial change in the climate system that, that will, there will be a human fingerprint on it for 100,000 years or more. One of your colleagues at University of Chicago, David Archer, has done this really good book, The Long Thaw. So that's already, a big chunk of that's baked in. Uh, emissions tweaks don't really change anything uh, measurably in our climate outcomes for decades to come. Um, no politician wants to hear any of that. Um, and your science uh, reveals this, there are these implicit scary things in the system, uh, with or without greenhouse forcing. And there's this, we're, we're changing a lot of things, like there's, we're going toward 9 billion people, all who, of whom want a, a, at least a middle class uh, existence uh, yeah. in the future. And so how do you, how do you keep at it? Well, I, I guess it would help if, I, if Star Trek would explain how we got to the post-scarcity economy. Like that, I think that would be really useful, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, otherwise, I mean, one of the things that's helpful for me is the fact that I do work on long time scales, right? So I'm, I'm already, whether through training or some sort of natural <laughs> tendency at birth, um, I already tend to be comfortable with a uh, lack of immediacy um, in terms, or, you know, things can be urgent, but they don't necessarily need to happen right away. Um, and so, you know, I have a, I, I think that. Yeah, and, and even if there's nothing that we can do, I can console myself by the fact that I'm learning about you know, the, how, the, how the world works, and that's inherently fascinating, even if no one does anything with that information. But, um, but, would, you agree that, <laughs> but would you agree that pointing out deep vulnerability is, can lead to solutions on that front right away? That, oh, that, absolutely. That, that's energizing. Yeah. You know, right? no, absolutely, yes. Yeah. And so, I mean, and I think we see examples of that you know, from, from the work that, I, that, that people like my colleagues and I do, um, especially an understanding of, for example, um, abrupt climate change, which I mentioned before, that, that's, that that was even a possibility, right? That that's something that can happen inherently in the Earth system, that there are tipping points. And one of the, the sort of thinking, sort of horizon scanning issues, I think, in, in the coming decades is going to be um, being, what, trying to figure out whether or not we can actually identify a critical transition in, in either an ecosystem or in an ice sheet or in the atmosphere in the way it circulates. Um, being able to, to identify when that's coming um, in, in theory so that we can either prepare for it or forestall it, I think is sort of the cutting edge of the science right now. Um, but I, I, I do think that um, one thing that gets lost in some of these discussions is the idea that um, by studying the past, there, there's act there are actually often a lot of, of stories of resilience, 
And those I find incredibly helpful because there's a, there's, it's often very difficult to talk about these issues. I do a lot of science communication uh, with the general public. And a lot of people just don't want to listen. They've sort of already shut down because it's so negative. Um, but being able to understand what makes certain kinds of uh, you know, spheres of the Earth system or ecosystems or species resilient to climate change um, and being able to you know, feel comfortable either with letting those things just be resilient on their own. Um, it helps sort of constrain all the, the list of things that I need to worry about, which I find very helpful. Um, and so, so I, th I think by we need to spend a little bit more time focusing on the, the Earth system record of stasis, where things have not changed a lot, um, and resilience. Um, and also just be able to understand that this idea of sort of catastrophic climate change that affects you know, all aspects of the Earth system. I mean, someone came up to me after my morning session on cloning woolly mammoths, talking about you know, mass extinctions and you know, are we headed to a you 97% know, extinction level? And, and, and I just, I have a really hard time getting that worked up about that because um, A, I think we have a long way to go before we're even close to anything like that. I think we have to worry more about human systems and the resiliency of human systems sooner than we need to worry about the resiliency of a lot of ecosystems. Um, but you know, even at the end of the day, 97, you know, Earth has bounced back from a 97% species extinction. So um, I doubt that we would, um, <laughs> but you know, there, there, will, there will still be an Earth. There will still be biodiversity. Yeah, yeah. So Michael, I, I, it was only when I was covering this stuff in the last 10 years that I, I, I think I stumbled on the idea of hyperbolic discounting of the future yeah. <laughs> from, your, from you and your economic wizards. Yeah. That we have these patterns that, are, that don't fit this problem. So, yeah. uh, so what do you do? You know, how do you deal with this? So I, I think, you know, I'll come back to what I said at the beginning. I think, which is you know, maybe a slightly hyper-rationalist view of the world, is at the end of the day, we, I think, have failed to communicate the who, what, where, when, why of climate change. It's still this kind of spooky thing of two degrees C and some people will die, but maybe not where I live. Uh, and I think there are great opportunities to better communicate through research and then through people who are really good at communication, not necessarily academics, uh, what climate change will look like. Uh, and my, my theory of change is that that can help uh, build the political support uh, that would be necessary to do something. And then the second thing is, at the end of the day, uh, which I think we've all danced around, but no one's really said it very directly, people are, you know, industries, firms, households who consume fossil fuels that uh, involve the release of CO2 are all, not all, but in most parts of the world being allowed to cause climate change for free. Uh, and that's like a, actually a pretty uninteresting economics problem. Uh, we know exactly what to do, uh, that you put a price on it, and then you don't have to get into figuring out should you uh, like have clean cook stoves here or should you have uh, residential energy efficiency programs there. The market can sort all that out and find out what uh, the cheapest solutions are. Uh, and so I, I, my view is if we could get a deeper understanding in the public sphere, not just in the United States, uh, that would help provide the foundation, uh, and at the end of the day, when people understand this damage that is being done, uh, and that people and firms and households are being allowed to do it for free, uh, I think, you know, uh, isn't the great Churchill quote about the United States uh, that uh, they often end up doing the right thing, but only after they've tried everything else? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, this is a long-term problem, and uh, we don't have to solve it this second. So you're, you guys are all going to get to ask the really hard questions in a minute, but Varun, um, you're just beginning your, the, the, the young people on this panel, uh, you know, I, I've always wondered. Am I in that group? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. We won't, we won't ask for ages, but they can, they can look it up easy enough. So Varun, you know, uh, dealing with this divisiveness and, uh, you know, how do you set policy? Obama had this really great phrasing of when gas prices spiked, I think it was like 2007, eight, nine. How do we avoid a shock to trance approach on energy policy? And you were talking about this investment, investment. And the same thing could apply to, to vulnerability reduction. You know, California had this epic drought and then they got deluged. And, uh, and I wrote a piece on Dot Earth at the time, you know, can we avoid a shock to trance policy on water in California? So going forward, how do you set your priorities and, and how do you think this could play out? Yeah, I mean, you bring up spikes. Um, 
short-term spikes in, uh, for example, commodity prices, be they gas or oil prices, um, can really affect long-term policy trends in a way that's unfavorable. So for example, uh, in the 80s, uh, we rolled back our fuel economy standards, and then they stayed that way for the next two decades, even as oil prices gently inched up. Um, now, we're in danger again of we have low oil prices, and President Trump has promised to roll back, or, or, or talked about rolling back President Obama's stringent fuel economy standards. The problem is these oil prices may fluctuate like this, but once you set a particular policy, for example, how efficient your vehicles need to be, you set that for a long time. The car makers have you know, many years where they have to make design decisions, and you're kind of locked in. And so we, it would be folly to make long-term design decisions based on short-term commodity cycles. That's kind of the first point I'd make. The second point is, you know, going forward in this era where, you know, I believe that there is, uh, we should be doing careful academic work to figure out where we're going, but it's also really important to have uh, political buy-in. I've struggled personally with what approach to take. So for example, I know that this 100% renewable energy goal has a very galvanizing effect. Cities around the country are signing up to a 100% renewable energy pledge. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really gotten folks charged up, no pun intended, even though, um, I don't actually think that's the right place to be heading. But what if it leads to the same sorts of near-term actions? Should I just be on board with it? Um, I, I found, I'm, I'm still early in my career, but I find that I think the tack I wanna take is to stay academically honest. Um, the, the best thing I think that we can do, those of us who study policy, is to be as honest as possible uh, so that we don't start from false information. And from there, once we have correct information, we can determine uh, what's the best uh, political motivation strategy going forward? The last thing I'll say is different things obviously appeal to different people. And I was struck um, listening to some of the conversations here at the Aspen Ideas Festival to hear that there were motivations for pursuing policies that I support, but that came from a completely different point of view. For example, I support nuclear energy because I think it's the largest form of clean energy in the United States and it should be a part of a low carbon portfolio. It's clean electrons. But in addition, uh, I heard Tom Fanning, uh, CEO of Southern Company yesterday, uh, he sat down with me and he explained why it's so important from a national security perspective that we keep some expertise in this country, uh, companies that know how to both build nuclear reactors and manage the nuclear fuel cycle because that advances our non-proliferation goals around the world, for example, in countries like Iran. And listening to that, I heard, you know what, this is a national security priority that is going to appeal <laughs> to a certain political segment. It's also a very valid argument. And perhaps that's another uh, a thread to pull on when defending uh, nuclear power in this country. So that taught me that utilizing these multiple perspectives is a good way of advancing uh, the policies that we think are the right ones. Yeah, and now it's your turn. Um, the key thing that's revealed here in 30 years of examining this too is that diversity is inevitable. That not everyone will ever have the same impression of what the problem is or what the solutions are. And that's good. That's how humans have gotten through most of our experience so far and done okay so far, but you know, with questions going forward. So uh, if you could state your questions and keep them brief, uh, there'll, there'll be room for the most possible ones. Um, that woman there and then the guy with the blue and then right here and then we'll do a couple more. Great panel. Um, what are the basic evidences of climate change that we as laymen can use in conversation, i.e. Lonnie Thompson and his ice core evidence? I, I think one of the best ones you can use is, is actually whatever is relevant to your daily experience. Um, I think personal stories and, and, and narratives are, are really powerful uh, and very effective if you're talking with your local community. Um, so, you know, noticing things like phenology, the timing of things in nature, right? You know, when, when leaves are changing, um, when, when your garden starts, um, when, an ice, when, when ice comes off a lake. Those, you know, those sorts of anecdotal lines of evidence in your community, um, I think, are you know, something people can relate to, you know, if you're an ice fisherman or something like that. Um, being able to, to talk about, about those things are actually incredibly powerful. Um, certainly, I think things like ice cores, which give us a you know, one million year or, or one million year long annual resolution record of the linkage between temperature and carbon dioxide is really is really powerful and certainly can give people a, a good sense of you know what the natural climate variability is and how what's happening now is different than what's happened in the past. But honestly, the 
I think the things that, that really tend to be most effective, we, we've learned from some of this climate uh, communication research, tend to just be the things that you're really familiar with. Um, you know, air quality, you know, children, you know, children with asthma, sort of meeting people halfway, especially if they're skeptics um, around things that you both care about. And so whatever it is that's, you know, local to you, whether it, you know, that's skiing or whatever, just find that, that common ground and talk about that and talk about your personal observations and just normalize discussions about climate change. That's incredibly effective. Yeah. And then the man with the blue pad. So that, that's a good segue to my question. Hold on for the mic. Well, I'm sorry. My name is Kenny Field, and I'm in the renewable energy business. And my, that's a good segue to my question. Um, I have friends who are climate deniers. And just in the last week, they've sent me uh, articles that say that this week is called giant, uh, sorry, Junk Science Week. And that uh, Secretary Pruitt has just come out with a paper that says that there has not been any warming in the, in the Earth for the last 20 years. And there's lots of other studies, okay, that are saying the same thing. And they send me this information, and they point to my business or what we're doing or my feeling about climate change, and they think that we're just full of baloney. How do you answer them when there is science? They say there's scientific, such strong scientific evidence from satellites and other data that shows that over the last 20 years there has been no, glo no global warming. Okay, um, and so here and then here, uh, the one thing I would just offer is. Uh, you might, you might point them to the YouTube video of the guy in Oklahoma who's going solar, who will never believe in global warming. In other words, there's two separate questions. Uh, don't worry about, get comfortable with their differences on global warming because you'll never be able to convince them to change. This is this work that, that um, Jacqueline mentioned. There's a website, culturalcognition.net. This is this guy, guy at Yale. And he says, just, just let me read you a quote from his uh, that's worth hearing. His work, it's empirical work, he says, what, uh, what you believe about global warming does not express what you know. It expresses who you are. In other words, it's become an identity, part of your identity. <coughs> and if you're dug in as a libertarian or a conservative, uh, you know, abortion, gun rights, global warming, it's, global warming has become one of those things. So, but you could definitely talk to them about renewable energy and not even, and, but don't expect that that having some debate about which pieces of information are, are false or true will, will be productive. That would be my advice. Can I add to that? Yeah. I mean, and I do think that's perhaps, however, you still have to think for both sides. Is, uh, is that science there? Or is it, is it fake science? Like, you know, is it fake news? Yeah, yeah. Does, 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 does the science that these people are now are, are stating, okay? You've got a yeah. Secretary of Energy stating it that the United States government has looked at all the data and the United States government has come to the conclusion that there yeah. has not been any global warming for the last 20 years. Is that a true statement or is that a made up statement? So I th I, as a scientist and an educator, it hurts me to say that sometimes facts don't work. Right, uh, it's taken me a lot of resistance. And to as a journalist, by the way. Right, too. like to, to know that, like just telling people, well, that study is, I mean, I could spend time with that person and say that study is wrong, here's how it's, you know, misrepresenting the data, here, here's, you know, here's, here's who funded the data, you know, the science, et cetera. Um, and okay, I, can I just jump in on some point? Yeah. I think that is not frequently, uh, frequently rec uh, recognized frequently enough uh, that certainly not all of the science that points in the opposite, that it says climate change is real, but a surprising fraction of it is funded by people who have money on the line. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that, you know, I think we should all be very clear about the, you know, just because it's a study does not give it equal standing. Uh, and uh, the people often don't pay for studies. Uh, people are very reluctant to fund studies, that is private organizations are re reluctant to fund studies if they don't have some confidence in where the answer is going to end up. Um, I just for the sake of expedience, I, I'd like to get in these, this question here and then here, because we only have four minutes left. And then, <laughs> then, uh, um, the question is about yeah. how do you handle risk? The problem with climate warming or any kind of climate change is that it is impossible really to predict because the risk ranges are so big. I'm an expert on risk management. That's my profession, okay? So the only way you manage risk is you diversify the solutions. So my question is, when you look at the areas that could possibly benefit from climate change, can you identify with some certainty 
areas that are really relatively cheap to move into and that the population could begin building resilience mm -hmm. around moving from areas that are high risk in the near in the near term, 20 to 30 years of generation, <laughs> to areas that are lesser risk. I, I, I think some of that's happening. Uh, you know, the, I think the growing of wine is moving north and along the Pacific Coast. Uh, I, you know, I'm not an expert on land values in Canada, but I have the sense that uh, they're going up. They're going up. So, I mean, markets <laughs> markets are very effective at yeah, digesting are. information. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but just to, because we're running out of time, let's get one more on the floor, and then we can have a little final discussion. Great. Uh, two quick things for you guys to react to. One is, we cannot solve climate change without solving energy poverty. Number one. Right. Uh, number two. The reason we find ourselves in the U.S. In, in a polarized state is climate change, which relates to CO2, criteria pollutants, and particulates, has become a fight between fossil and renewable. Those two are not equivalent, and none of us are on either side are willing to discuss that openly. Let's use this as a final yeah. round. Uh, Varen, just a yeah. really short thought. Yeah. Um, so, so uh, just to respond to a couple of the things that have been said, um, I will say uh, there has been a, con uh, in academic circles, there's been a, a strain of thought from, I think, conservative circles that says, look, climate change is happening. Um, however, we're going to use some of the economic studies, the few economic studies that exist of what, say, the economic impacts of climate change will be in 2050 to argue that, in fact, it's not going to be that bad. Um, and that, I think, is a motivating factor for why we should really include the economists uh, wholesale in, 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 in our a, that's accounting. That's not a popular view. <laughs> in our accounting of what's going to happen. For example, this, the strain of conservative thought will say, hey, if we only shave a couple percentage points off GDP by 2050, I'm pretty sure we can take that hit and then fund fossil fuel energy that'll give us even more economic growth to outweigh it. Now, I think the answer here is more careful economic studies of the impacts going forward through 2050, through more careful modeling, et cetera. We need to, be, we need to very carefully fund both the social science and the physical science of, of climate change. Um, and then briefly, I'll say, Hilda, um, uh, you mentioned resilience and how we take uh, risk into account. I think you're absolutely right. Um, there are certain forms of clean energy. Uh, and again, I'll call you out, um, KR, for uh, fuel cells are a, an extremely resilient form of energy. They're distributed, and they can withstand, for example, Hurricane Sandy. You may not see that price reflected in the average daily cost in dollars and cents of that energy, but there is a cost associated or a benefit associated with the resiliency for these uh, uh, long tail events. And I think that needs to be priced in. Um, and increasingly, some states like New York are starting to do that. 30 seconds. Yeah, so I, I'm gonna, I think I took care of this question, uh, conveniently interpreted it as uh, the first thing I said, uh, which is that really I don't think of this as a climate change problem. Uh, mm -hmm. I think of it as a global energy challenge. And my view is that that challenge has, is like a stool that has three legs. Uh, one is how to increase access to inexpensive and reliable sources of energy everywhere, in the United States <coughs> and around the world. Two. Uh, in the process of doing that, how do you avoid extraordinarily undesirable and human harming impacts of conventional pollution associated with the use of some fossil fuels? I took Kara's point to be that natural gas is very different than coal, uh, which is absolutely right about. And then the third is, in a, how do we avoid disruptive climate change in achieving these other uh, two goals? And the reason I think it's like the greatest thing to work on and the greatest challenge humanity faces is it's easy to think of policies or interventions that could be useful for hitting one or two of those goals, but to get all three of them necessarily involves trade-offs. Uh, and those trade-offs can be very painful for societies and what is so challenging about the climate problem is it requires trade-offs across countries. Uh, where uh, So anyway, I think that is the number one issue. Last. And I actually think it's not a climate problem or an energy problem necessarily. I think it's a will problem, a political will problem, right? We have all these great ideas and innovations and we have lots of data, but um, I, I, I move towards how do we get buy-in? How do we get, you know, voters and the, the people that represent them to put these plans into action? And that to me makes it come down to questions of communication, um, fighting climate silence by, by normalizing discussions of climate change and coming to sort of common ground, finding empathy with people. And if my dad, who's a, 
who's, who worked in the coal industry, um, does not believe that what's happening now is outside of the range of natural variability, but he accepts that curbing emissions has positive impacts on health. And you know what, if that's how he gets there, I'm okay with that. I don't need him to understand you know, the specifics of um, the carbon cycle, right? And so that's point one, um, or and two, I guess. And the third point is we didn't talk a lot about natural systems. Um, I, I would just hesitate, just, I'll, I'll just throw this out here now, that um, when we talk about monetizing things, um, it's very d dangerous to do that with nature. Um, it's very difficult to put a price on a species or on the aesthetic value or the spiritual value that we place on nature. And attempts to do that so far, I think, have not worked out very well for natural systems. And so there's still going to be a component of, of, of these out, the outcomes of climate change that affect things we care about in a deep way that, aren't ne that can't necessarily have a price tag attached to them. And we need to be willing to have those conversations about our values in ways that don't necessarily distill down to you know, a price tag. Right. So those who want to go deeper, those who didn't get the answer, their, had their questions answered at 115 in Pepke Auditorium, I'm leading a deep dive, a deeper dive into these issues. And at three o'clock, I think there's a coal discussion too. Um, so there's lots more to come here. And there's much to learn online. On the question of risk, uh, Brett Stevens, the new New York Times columnist, who, when he quoted me in his inaugural piece on global warming, he misinterpreted what I had written about it as, as meaning, okay, we don't know a lot about global warming, therefore we need to just sort of, that means it's good now, we can just discuss it more. And, and I, I, I wrote a piece in ProPublica responding saying, you know, actually there's plenty of instances where we make decisions in the face of deep uncertainty. Uh, deep uncertainty, there's a website, believe it or not, there's an, there's an organization called the Society for Decision Making Under Deep Uncertainty. <laughs> Deepuncertainty.org is their website, it's a useful place to go. Thank you all, thank you all.